No, I... <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> um... What I meant was, um... I, I like you, Mary. <sighs> I like you a lot. <laughs> I want to ask you a question straight out, flat out. I want you to give me the honest answer. What do you think the chances are of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together? Well, Lloyd, that's difficult to say. And we really don't hit me with it. Just give it to me straight. I came a long way just to see you, Mary. Just least you can do is level with me. What are my chances? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. So we've, we've covered a lot of ground at this point. We're in part four, so you can get all the previous parts uh, on our YouTube channel. They were, they were live streamed last week. They're live streamed actually right now, although we don't really promote the live stream part of it. But that means that it's there for you to go back and grab them. And the video clips and everything are embedded within, although some of them may be muted because of copyright issues. So, I like that one was probably muted. Aren't you glad you're here so you could hear it? So, I'm going to start out tonight with a discussion question. This is kind of a fill in the blank. So, let's get creative. We're going to, for you all that may not be familiar, we'll run a mic around and get your comments and your wisdom and insights. So, so what constitutes a date? A date is when, and then you fill that blank. This can be tricky. <clears throat> okay, as I have discovered, you both parties don't necessarily have to know it's a date for it to be a date. <laughs> Though it is very nice to inform the other party that what you are doing is, in fact, a date. So, I'll so get you're off my uh, now. Can, uh, if we could just take a moment, are yeah, you I'm saying are you saying that both parties should know that it's a date or Please. not? <laughs> Please. Did you say please? Yes. So I'm assuming from your, it, it, that implied here is maybe yeah. an experience on your part. Yeah. In which you were on a date that you didn't know was a date. I thought we were friends. I thought we were friends for several years after until, yeah, okay, it's a long okay. story. <laughs> All right. Please speak with your intentions. Thank you, Kaya, for your vulnerability and your transparency. Uh, well. I suppose a date is spending time, like two people spending time together with romantic um, motive, usually. Okay. A date is when we do anything together. <laughs> it's getting kind of syrupy in here. Can you guys kind of help us with this? I haven't seen them all day. When two people who are interested in a relationship spend time together with the purpose of getting to know each other better and to discern a relationship. That was very precise. Precision. Did you read the dictionary first or something? Okay, just checking. A dried fruit. <laughs> okay, so he's banned. Kind of like... Kind of like a YouTube ban, a social media ban. That did it. That did it, huh? Logan, you're done. <laughs> Until next week. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, that was it. No more. Uh... So does a date always have to be two people? No. Group date. Somebody said recently that the Big Ben trip's like a big group date. 
Ew. Oh, awkward. Oh, no. Okay, erase that from your mind. That, that's not, that's not, okay. A strike, yeah, it's been stricken from the record. All right, so here's some interesting facts. Let's see if you know these, if you already knew these. Uh, today, at any given time, more than half of all American adults are single. Did you know that? So in any church, I mean, whether they're old or young, people are often, uh, in this day and time, are largely single. So that means that most churches are full of half-single people, whether they're young adults or not. Did you know that the median age for marriage today for women is 28.1? That means half of them are older and half of them are younger than 28.1. And for men, it is now, it has inched its way up, it is now 30.5. And you'll be glad to know that Texas is slightly lower. <laughs> I noticed the more conservative kind of Bible Belt states tend to be, have a lower average, but this is the national average. So in 20, to compare, you'll notice there it has a note compared to 20, uh, in 1960, the average age for women was 20 years old, and the average age for men was 23. It wasn't that much different for me when I was married, when Jeanette and I were married in 1977. Uh, I would say that the, if I was looking, the average age for women was 21. So it hadn't changed a lot since even 1960. Uh, men was maybe slightly bigger, like 23 and a half, 24, something like that. So, Jeanette was the ripe old age of 22 when she got married. So, she was like not too far off the average, and I was a little below the average. So, 93%, now this, you might find this reassuring because one of the struggles that people have is, man, I'm already ripe old age of 24, and I don't see anything on the horizon. What am I going to do? Am I ever going to find someone? But this should be reassuring. When you see this stat, you say, well, it says here, 93% of individuals have been married by the time they're 55 years old. So at that point, we just have to figure that if they're not married at that point, it's probably because they're not that interested. There's somebody for everybody. It just, not, it just may not be in the timetable you had in mind. 72% of millennials, and I realize some of you are not millennials, but this is the stat. Some of you are pre-millennial, um, Gen Z, right? 72% of millennials believe cohabitation is a good idea. Now, we already went through that. We went through why it's not. We went through the disaster that's the social, cultural, practical disasters that are occurring in the United States today because... We have adopted non-biblical values of relationships. And so this is, this is a very concerning stat. 72% of millennials believe cohabitation is a good idea. When in fact it is not a good idea, it's a disaster. So we went through all the stats. Go back and grab that in part one if you'd like. 57% of adults have or will live with... Or, did I not write this right? Set 57% of adults have or will live. Okay, I put an extra word in there on my, on my thing. Will live together before marriage. 25% of millennials. Now, this is a projection, a more recent projection, maybe a year or two ago. This projection said that they are expecting that 25% of millennials... And I don't know if this includes Gen Z or not, but 25% of millennials will never get married. Isn't that it? I mean, isn't that fascinating? Anyway, there's a, there's a basis for that and there are several reasons why they're projecting that. But many, many do not have a career path. And so they have no means of providing for a family. Many of them are waiting much longer to get married. And so they develop a habit of singleness that becomes a lifetime habit. They, they uh, may be placing less value placed on marriage. They're, and because of cohabitation, 25% of millennials are cohabitating. So all those things undermine and demotivate and de-incentivize marriage itself. So let's quick review. 
uh, and then I'm going to actually expand on a couple of points. But we talked about design. We talked about the fact that, that God has a design and that he has the right design. And we follow his design. We follow the boundaries that he set in place that we are going to do better. We're going to be more successful in life in general. One of the principles we looked at is the principle of temple, meaning that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that God wants us to live in purity. And it's a lost art today. This basic fundamental idea, and we talked about why it's so important. Love is the word that's slapped on everything to justify anything. And so there's a, ter a terrible misunderstanding of what love even is in our culture. But love from a biblical standpoint is very clearly uh, enumerated. And we see it in the demonstration of God and who he is. It says God so loved what did that mean that God so loved? God so loved the world that he gave. So he made a choice. He made a choice for the highest good of the world he loved by sen sending his son and coming and living among us and dying and being crucified. Love for God was not pleasant. It was not a happy moment. It was not something that made him feel better. It was something that broke his heart. And so love is not necessarily as we've embodied it in a feeling, a good feeling. Uh, the principle not to defraud one another. In other words, the scripture says, Song of Solomon, do not awaken or rouse or waken love until it pleases. In other words, there's a timing. And one of the frustrations that people go through is they awaken love in the wrong setting at the wrong season and the wrong timing. And then it leads to a, a kind of a, a, can lead to a lot of frustration and, um, and can lead to a lot of compromise. So that principle not to defraud, you may stay, you may be committed to purity. You may live and understand what love actually is. You may have a lot of the principles and boundaries in place. And you may be generally love the Lord and please him. But many Christians will, this is the principle, even though they may keep all the others, that they will often violate because they'll begin a relationship out of season. And so that's what the scripture is saying. Don't awaken love. You can. You can awaken love out of season. And so it's saying, be wise. Don't do that. And so we looked at what is the framework? What are, what are examples of defrauding relationships? So I have a little kind of statement that I wrote out here. Uh, think about this. An individual not deeply rooted in the principles of God's word and in the fear of God will often, when faced with a choice, ignore critical warning signs and every caution because their entire perspective is driven by how this person makes them feel. It's all about what I want and what I need. With that mindset, every character test and every principle in this series can be explained away as they convince themselves that they are the exception. And they will always use love as the cover story for their choices. This can happen to such an extent that a person will persist in a relationship, even if it is shown to them that this person is chemically dependent, a known liar, a thief, morally compromised, disingenuous in faith or worse. Everything's excused in the name of love. And so people will sustain toxic relationships. And everybody around them can usually see it, at least eventually. So we looked at this chart last week. What does a healthy relationship look like? And if you can, you know, can, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but they basically a light, casual relationship that is undemanding and unpossessive and not jealous versus a heavy relationship where there's ownership, where the other partner belongs to the other one, where there's a very strong parameters, um, possessive, sexually permissive. There's no more mystery. It becomes, an, it becomes, in the end, an unhappy relationship. Even though it's become toxic, it is no longer even pleasant. But because individuals are invested in this relationship, they continue to sustain it. So what we want, what we're looking for are friendships. 
a light relationship where it's free and unpossessive and sexually reserved or pure. It's mysterious. It has, it's fun. And what it's really describing in the top section is really a more of a casual friendship. So we, in this, it, we just talked about possession here, but one of the principles we looked at last week was the right of possession. What happens is couples out of season or prematurely, before they really have a biblical right to, they begin to take possession of each other. They begin to have rights over each other. Um, and so we looked at what does a possessive relationship look like. We talked about jealousy. But, but really what you have to remember is that that if somebody takes you on a date, which apparently Kaya went on a date that she didn't know was a date. But, but the fact is that, that the question is, and I remember with this, asking myself this question from the very first time I dated a young Christian lady in college, early college, and she was in late high school, is she's a daughter of the Lord. And so however I'm treating her, I have to give direct account to God for how I'm treating her. Am I treating her with respect? Am I pushing boundaries? Am I, you see? And so you have to remember, even in a married relationship after many years, and Jeanette and I have been married many years, I have to remember that she is a daughter of the Most High King. She is, even in that sense, not completely my possession and I'm not completely her possession. That we are ultimately possession of each other. Actually, you shared something at the married fellowship. You mind if I share that with them? That was so powerful. And um, she's, she's not going to mind. But uh, what she related was in our early marriage, was it the first few years? Or she, uh, she was feeling a, a compelling to want to change me. And a lot of people felt like they need to change me <laughs> over the years. And um, it doesn't go well. And so, um, will I ever do one of those hikes again? <laughs> uh, probably, but I'll be more careful. And there's certain things, you know, you, you learn, right? So, um, it's amazing how much trouble a split-second mistake can make. You know, it's so easy to break an ankle. <laughs> I never knew how easy it was to break an ankle until I did it. Woo, psh, snap, man, that was fun. <laughs> Man. So anyway, what, what Jeanette was saying was that, that she had this tug of war going of trying to mold me, and shape me. And it was a frustration for her. And the Lord, when she's praying about it, the Lord spoke to her. And how did he say it? He said something like to you like, I don't want you to be changing him. He is my masterpiece. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Right, that's, yeah. That's it. So, so it's from a scripture. I'm repeating it since it's recorded and it couldn't be heard. But there's a scripture that talks about how we are his masterpiece. I wonder if that's the scripture that talks about the poema. The poema, the masterpiece, the creation, the, the handiwork of God. And so the Lord spoke to her and said in concerning me that I was his masterpiece kind of like don't mess with it so um, that's very powerful but that's really the case with every believer that we are a masterpiece of God we're his poema so how am I treating your daughter how am I treating your son um, so the problem is becoming possessive too early uh, and becoming intimate before there's appropriate commitment to protect the intimacy. So like any contract or covenant, uh, it needs to be protected. And that's what marriage does. Marriage is a covenant. It's a holy contract before God with witnesses in which uh, people are safer in their relationship. And it's a safety in which God designed for the, for the cultivation, for the nurturing of children. And so it's a very beautiful thing. And it's something that's being denigrated today in our society, the, even the whole idea and concept and definition of marriage. And so, but what, what you want to have is intimacy that is protected in the, 
in the commitment of marriage. And so, but people become, they're so much in a hurry to become intimate and to become sexual. There's such a expectation in that area so that they are way ahead of any real commitment. And real commitment really doesn't occur until marriage. You have, you can say, well, commitment is engagement, but engagement is a promise of intent to commit. Okay, but it's only a promise of intent. It's not unbreakable. Even in the eyes of God, an engagement is not the covenant, it's not the contract. Many people think somehow I'm engaged and I can't break this, but that's not true. It's a very intense period of evaluation. So, God is a jealous God. And he has a plan for you. He bought, we, bought you with a price and you belong to him. Not to any human being. We kind of we decided that in 1865 with the end of slavery. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of digress a little bit here. And we're going to look at 12. And there's actually a, a method to my madness here. It's from a researcher named Des, Dr. Desmond Morris. And he researched and discovered that there are 12 stages to bonding. And you'll notice some of these stages are stages that we have in normal friendship, you know, where you eye to body, eye to eye, voice to voice. In other words, in a normal friendship, you have those, you, you might even have a, a little bit of touch. You know, you might have embracing, hugging, things like that. I think I got a couple of hugs before the meeting tonight. So, but but this is mainly in a romantic context, okay? Not necessarily a casual friendship context. So what he's saying is that in a romantic relationship, where there's a romantic interest, it progresses with these 12 stages. And as it progresses, it goes hand to hand, hand to shoulder, hand to waist, face to face, hand to head, okay? So, and then he's saying that at this point, once you get to number 9, 10, 11, and 12, these are only appropriate in marriage. But here's the key I want you to get. And, and interesting on the hand-to-hand, -hand, you think, oh, what's the big deal there? We all hold hands when we pray together. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about in a romantic context. Now, you may feel that. So I happen to be in the prayer circle with that person and they're holding my hand right now, you know. You might have a little bit of a rush from that, but it's nothing. It's really nothing. It's an illusion, okay? And so, and so uh, but I remember a moment when Jeanette and I had an interest in each other. And I, I related to you guys that we had, our time, even prior to engagement, was characterized by mostly a, more of a friendship than it was a, an intense romance. It was intense because we kind of knew where it was going, but we weren't discussing it. We weren't talking about it. And we were very restrained in every, in every physical way. And so, but we did have a moment. I wouldn't call it a moment of weakness, but it was a very telling moment because at that moment, so we went, ended up on a, on a retreat with our Christian fellowship and we, we did what we don't allow on any of our trips. We coupled off. And so we went on a little path. It was dark, getting dark. And we went down to the lake. We were standing at the lake, enjoying the scenery. And on the way back, after we visited and talked a little bit, I just grabbed her hand. I held her hand. And it was one of the most exciting, thrilling, impacting moments because she held it back. And it was kind of like that was the moment where we realized that we really had an interest in each other, but we didn't really say anything. We just, in fact, from then on, we really didn't hold hands anymore. It was just that real special moment. We both knew what we had done in that moment, but it wasn't something we were going to continue doing around campus in front of people we knew and so forth. We just continued to maintain that we were going to be characterized by restraint and a friendship. But I'm wanting you to understand, you think, oh, well, what's the big deal of that? Hand to hand, big deal, hold hands, whatever. And I'm trying to help you understand that in the proper context, it can be very powerful. So, but today, young people miss it completely. Because they go through these so fast, or they bypass them. And the only thing, oftentimes, especially, you know, I mean, of course, I, I always think in terms of the, 
the young men are the ones that want to get to number 12, ASAP. But really in this day and time, I think it's because of the proliferation of porn, I'm not sure. And although young men are more, more prone, uh, but I've noticed I hear more and more stories of young women that are very aggressive. Um, that want to get to number 12 right away. And, and I think the motivation is different, but it's still breaking all the boundaries. So, so you know, I think of hand to head. You know, you think of, you think of like somebody in church. And so, so if somebody started like, if you had a kid, like a child, and they start playing with their mom's hair and stuff. You don't think anything of it because it's a child. But if somebody else started playing with that same mom's hair and they weren't their child, it would be fighting words. That'd be serious. So. Where am I going? Okay, there's a point to all this. I, I lost my way. So here's a very important point about these stages. Not that we need to understand every stage. But the quote from this doctor. Bonding is damaged when couples scramble the stages. In other words, when stages are skipped or rushed past, they can have a detrimental effect on the long-term bonding that makes a marriage strong. Just follow this. And then think about what we're doing as a society as we rush through all those stages. And we'll go back to the quote. Bonding is damaged when couples scramble the stages. If they kiss passionately on the first date, engage in heavy petting a month later, or have sexual intercourse before marriage, something precious is lost in their commitment to one another. They have not allowed the glue to dry. Unfortunately, that is how the Entertainment industry presents the ideal romantic relationship. And I mean, you see it. It's so reproducible in, in movies and television. And, you know, guy meets girl. Next scene, they're waking up in the same bed the next morning. And if you're lucky and you don't have to see anything beyond that. But, but that's a really common scenario. We've been seeing that since the 70s. Now, Jeanette and I watched a really old movie the other day. It's an old John Wayne movie, 1947. And it was, it was a moment in the movie where they, they had love at first sight, right? But nothing happened. They, I mean, they didn't even kiss for a long time. It was kind of like, and that's the extent that it went. And even when they kissed, they had his cowboy hat so you couldn't see it. You know, it's like, it, it's, the perspective is completely different. It was incomprehensible to think that a relationship is set in motion by having sex. There was a process that they began to relate, even though there was an initial attraction. So, so let's, I'm going to move past, but mainly I'm just trying to expound on this idea of why it is important to get God's timing and to be patient and to wait. And if, and, and if a young lady or young man is on a date with you and they're pushing too hard, then it's disrespectful to you and it's disrespectful to the Lord and his ways. And what you have to do is hold your line and hold your ground and say, listen, you know, this individual that can't respect my values and they keep pushing and keep nagging, then you need to, you need to move on. Be done with it. Be liberated. But I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a long time before I find someone else. You know, don't be desperate. Don't be clingy. Don't be hard up. Know you, who you are in the Lord. So we've been looking at discerning God's will. The first thing we looked at was, um, was having a common faith. It's like the most important thing of all. It really legit that you share a common passion for the Lord, a common love for the Lord, a depth in that faith. And so the scripture calls it being equally yoked. And that, so I'm going to run through, that was number one. I'm going to run through 10 things. So we're kind of setting up a grid so you can kind of say, okay, if this person that I'm interested in, you know, how does it look? What are we doing? You know, if I'm going to kind of test, test this individual's character and so forth. And I'll, I'll tell you what, if more people would go through these 10 things and really stick by them, you would see a lot of relationships that would never happen. 
and a lot of breakups that would never happen and a lot of frustration, a lot of moral breakdowns that would never happen. If you would just stick with these 10 values that you see from Scripture, the, the guardrails are there to protect you. They're there to secure you. They're there to guide you along the way. The Scripture says that the word, of the, the word of the Lord is like a lamp to my feet and it guides you through the dark so you can see and not trip or fall over a cliff or something. So, number two, does this individual have a clear conscience? And so, I'm going to go through these. Let's see. Um, I had the scriptures for shared faith and value. I do want to point this out on the shared faith and value. And we're, what I'm going to do is it'll just keep coming back with this list. But there was actually a study done. Um, I think I have a screen for it. Survey of 161 men and women published in 2003. It's a little bit aged, but nonetheless, it's human nature is human nature. A journal of the Scientific Study of Religion found that inner religious commitment uh, coupled with church attendance was associated with a reduced tendency to engage in extramarital affairs. Hmm. Or mate poaching, as they call it. Adults, adults who have children with someone of another faith have a divorce rate three times that of single faith households. The greatest predictor of marital stability, however, isn't whether a couple is of the same faith, but how much they agree on the role religion will play in their lives. Okay, did you follow that? What they're saying is what really matters, not if you check the boxes and say we believe the same, what they're saying is how you practice your faith. What does it look like in a practical way? How deeply held are these beliefs? Do you live them out? What they're saying is that if you live them out and you practice your faith and you do that in common, that that leads to a secure marriage, a lifetime uh, harmony. And so it's very powerful. And that's just a psychological study about not being unequally yoked. But we should already know that we shouldn't be unequally yoked, not because we see a study, but because the scripture says for us not to be. Number two, does he or she have a clear conscience? If you want to marry a prince, you must be a princess. Is, this, is the individual you're interested in honest? Do they steal? Do they lie? Do they, do they do what they say they will do? Are they a person of their word? Do they have integrity? It's real basic. You say, well, duh, but you wouldn't believe how many people will compromise on one of those points. You just say, well, but I really like them, or they're really cute, or whatever. I have, a, I have a clip for you. We're talking about character. Yes, Logan's excited. How's it going? It's very late, Ignacio. Uh-huh. Give me a second. Mm. Good sauce. My mother was a Lutheran missionary from Scandinavia, and my father a deacon from Mexico. They tried to convert each other, but they got married instead. And then they died. Who is this Encarnacion? 
Mm. Well, my favorite color is light tan. My favorite animal is puppies. I like serving the Lord. Hiking, play volleyball. You gotta be kidding me. Everything you just said is my favorite thing to do every day. So, do you enjoy yourself here at the Brotherhood? Skip that one earlier. I was supposed to be in the in the unequally yoked section. We were talking about his parents and and then he's you know how how you meet somebody and all of a sudden you you see through a filter like we have everything in common and this kind of thing. So uh, now this one when we talk about conscience and having a clear conscience, I want to show you this clip um, which is labeled number thirteen. You guys, can y'all flip another one real quick? The question is, before this clip, does he or she have something to hide? Well, I heard a noise, so I came down to see if everything was okay. Everything's fine. I just, I'm sorry. I, I saw a light on in here, and I kind of stumbled in, and I didn't realize. Well, that's okay. See anything interesting? No, not at all. I mean, I mean, I mean, this is great, though. I love this, what you, it's a cozy little nook. I noticed you were looking at that when I came in. Yeah. It's an antique polygraph machine. Is that what that is? Because I've seen these before, but I never saw one actually up close. You know what? Why don't you try that on? Oh. That's okay. Oh, come on. We'll have some fun. I'll show you how it works. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I shouldn't. Well, why should you be afraid? You have nothing to hide. <laughs> no, I know. I know you know, so there shouldn't be any problem. No, there's no problem. So, try it on. Okay. I'll help you. Don't worry. You'll enjoy this. All right. Looks complicated. Now, these aren't 100% accurate, right? They're... Well, you'd be surprised how accurate they are. They can tell fairly easily if someone's lying or not. Now I'm going to ask you some questions, and all you have to do is answer yes or no. Okay. All right. Let's give it a whirl. Did you fly on an airplane today? Yes, I did. No peeking. Did we eat pot roast for dinner tonight? Yes. Was it undercooked? No, it was rare. It was a little rare for my taste, but I, I'm but I was kidding. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> relax, relax. The needles are jumping. Have you ever watched pornographic videos? No. I mean, well, I don't. Yes or no. This video clip kind of inspires me, maybe before every couple I marry, kind of in the pre-counseling session, use an old lie detector test like that. <laughs> uh, just kidding. All right. So number three, in other words, that was all about, do we have anything to hide? What is the individual's attitude towards authority? How do they treat their mom? How do they treat their dad? Uh, how do they treat their boss? How do they treat their pastor? How do they treat their, see? And so, how do they te treat their teachers in college class? On and on you go, the authorities in your life. What is your attitude towards a police officer if they were to pull you over? And so all these things are authorities in our lives and how do we respond? What is our attitude? And so that, in Exodus it says, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So that's one of the Ten Commandments. To honor your father and mother. And so I think there are expressions that sometimes young people will use. Like, I don't, I don't really hear it that much anymore. Somebody will say, my old man or my old lady. You know, things like that. But to me, those are very disrespectful. That's not honoring to your parents. 
um, sometimes uh, my parents don't trust me. Well, maybe they shouldn't. And I realize here you're mostly adults. Might have few that are under 17 here, under 18. But the fact is that I remember my kids would say, Dad, don't you trust me? I said, no. No, I don't trust myself completely. So why would I trust you? Okay. Hebrews chapter 10 says this, Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be no benefit to you. And so the scripture is very clear about our attitude towards authority. Doesn't mean we never question authority. Doesn't mean that the authorities are always right or they're always correct. But there is an attitude in which God is in the structure of authorities. He set up the order of governments and so forth. Doesn't mean that everybody that occupies a governmental role is responsible or a good steward or shouldn't be removed. But what I'm saying is that the authorities themselves are something that we respect. Um, I mentioned last week or the week before that Jeanette and I, when I went and met with my dad, I was very eager to move forward my relationship with her in college. And after talking to my dad, I, I recognized, even though he was a non-Christian, I recognized that as an authority in my life, that he was, that God was speaking through him to me. And so I, I made a choice right then to delay whatever plans, whatever my intentions were, the entire process that I was wanting to set in motion concerning Jeanette and meeting her was going to be delayed for a year. And that meant I just needed to keep a holding pattern of basically friendship for a whole lot longer. And that allowed us to get a lot farther through college another year. And um, that was really very important now looking back. And that I was willing to submit to my dad and lay it out and listen to him and really listen to him and what his concerns were. Um, in light of that, in our attitudes sometimes with our parents, it's very important that you allow them to have input and that you're respectful. And don't create an antagonistic relationship. Well, you don't appreciate what I, you know, and this kind of thing. So here's another clip. Uh, this one in good company is the correct clip. What? I love her. I love you. You love her? She's my daughter. She's in college. She's a college student. I took out a frickin' second mortgage so she could go. Three years ago, she was in braces. I'm sorry. This guy. You had to sleep with him. Dad. 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 Dad, wait, I'm sorry. This had nothing to do with you. He's my boss, Alex. I know. It just happened. We made a deal, remember? We made a deal we'd always be honest with one another. Dad, I was like five years old when we made that deal. Yeah, I liked you better then. It's an awful thing to say. Dad, please don't walk away. I want to talk to you. Why? You don't need my advice about anything. And I know it's really hard to see it from your parents' perspective. And I felt like this video kind of opens a little door into our hearts. So you can kind of see for a moment how a dad is affected and how they care and how uh, they want to be respected. And she just respected him on multiple levels, even in that little short clip. And so I think it's very important that we honor our fathers and mothers and how we approach, you know, in relationships, whatever reason, now that you meet somebody or you have an interest in us moving forward is that we just disrespect our parents. Like, well, they can't understand anyway. And what do they have to say? And they're old fashioned or whatever. And we dismiss them. And sometimes I realize that we're facing a breakdown in the family today, and it's more complicated than a traditional husband and wife that you, you know, mom and dad that 
now you have blended families and all kinds. But you, you find a way to respect those authorities in your life the best way that you can, even when it's complicated. So the number four, the fourth thing that you should be looking for in somebody is healthy community. They should be involved in uh, Christian community. Do they have a working concept of a stable church commitment? Or do they jump ship because something doesn't go their way or they're kind of a loose cannon or they have no accountability, uh, easily offended all the time and I'm um, going to jump here and jump there. So, so it's very important that we become immersed into a Christian community where people know who we are, where there's an in, inbred accountability and a sense of submission and forbearance to one another. And uh, young adults are particularly uh, avid at doing this because you don't have as many conflicts of interest as when you have a family with children and so forth. And it's, it's more difficult, but you guys have a lot of fluidity. You have a lot of availability. And so, so but you say, well, you know, well, they, they don't get along with people. They're an introvert. Or they're, listen, we have a lot of introverts in our young adult community that are very immersed in community and they serve and they're active. Two of them are in Idaho hiking right now. I know, FOMO. Amanda and Madeline, you know, young professional women, they've got discretionary money and time and vacation time. And, and they're like putting up pictures every day on Facebook, like 20 a day. Look what we're doing, you know, look at us, a picture of us with a moose, you know, and this kind of stuff, uh, a statue of a moose. So that's why they're not here tonight. But they're, but you understand, they are very immersed in community here, even though they are strong eye introverts. And so we, as if you're a normal Christian, you seek communities, you seek ways to be committed and connected beyond just attending in anonymity on a Sunday morning. And we have a lot of people in our church that come on Sunday morning that just attend in anonymity. And I'm not necessarily going to be able to change them. I accept them and love them for where they are. But that's not God's plan. That's not the New Testament model of what it means to be a Christian in relationship with other, with other believers. So if, if you have a high standard in that area, you don't give in on that. Does this person love the body of Christ? Do they love fellow believers? Do they love Christian communities? Is that part of their DNA? Um, I have a discussion for you. I don't know if I have a screen for it or not. If the people in your life that love you, for instance, like your parents or siblings, pastors, best friends, if they are objecting to your choice in someone, why would they do that? Why would they be objecting? So let's throw out some ideas. They can see every red flag you can't. Ah, uh, okay. They're not emotionally invested in a relationship so that they're, they're not blindsided sometimes. Okay. So you're saying maybe they see it with a, um, a perspective that's more objective. Yeah. Okay. So I think half of it can be experience that people have been through. So they recognize what the outcome is going to be. And even if they haven't had that experience, such as like yourself, pastor, you've counseled people and you've seen relationships and you kind of seen this type and this type when they get together, this is the typical outcome. Right. So you're trying to protect both parties. Right. Okay. Because they're wrong. Anybody else? Okay. Um, well, one thing is these individuals usually in your circle, it's not like they're just trying to be spoilers. They're not like they're looking in on your life going, I just want to ruin their life by telling them I don't want them to be happy. And that's often how they're perceived. Well, for the first time in my life, I'm happy and you don't appreciate it. Why don't you support me? And yet, you know, you're pushing back. You're trying to 
maybe be protective. Sometimes people can be overly protective. In the end, you have to make your own decision. You can't make a decision for everyone else. But what they are is sometimes they are seeing something that you may not be seeing. There, there are red flags. There are things that <clears throat> you can have a sense of kind of being blinded by by all of it. So you have a, you know what a blind spot is, right? It's actually literally in your eye. There's a, a clump of nerves that your brain fills it in. But in fact, if you do your finger just right, it'll disappear. Like the top, it'll disappear. That's the blind spot. And everybody has that. And so what it's saying is that <clears throat> because we all need input from other people because we all have a blind spot that are times we're not seeing something clearly, especially in a romantic context. And maybe these individuals see seeing something you're not seeing and we need to listen to them and understand that oftentimes if they have the courage to even speak out, it's because they actually love you. They actually care and they're concerned. So, Sometimes, you know, what are they picking up? Uh, do they know something? Is there some objective fact that they have? Or is it intuitive? Something just rubs them wrong about this individual? I mean, you don't necessarily know until you can really talk it out with them. But when you do listen to them, Proverbs 70, 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So sometimes the wounds from a friend in that environment are really important. Number five, are, are the individual's rights yielded to God? In other words, are they seeking God fundamentally best in their life? Is, is the Lord the center of who they are and their motivation, the drive of their life? The, you know, I mean, one of the kind of indicators, it may sound odd, but I always, I always wonder, do they, does this individual believe in tithing? Do they give to the local church? Do they support? Do they believe in the principle? How do they handle their money? All these things go to the heart of this. And, I, you know, I, I've seen people that they just, not tithing often is reflective of, a, of an inability that individuals have to put roots down. Sometimes they're just in a financial crisis. And they may have good reasons they're struggling and they need understanding. But oftentimes people aren't tithing because there's a, they're having an issue with really putting roots down and having faith and investing in God's kingdom and believing in the local church and the work of the local church. And so those are issues that need to be understood. Why is it? Why aren't you tithing? Why don't you support financially the local church? Number six, life purpose. How do they see their job? Is their job, do they see the, the realm that they work in as a mission field? As a, I remember when I was working in medical devices, something I kind of miss. Even, even though we all worked out of homes and we were surgical reps and we were all over Texas, but I found that I was almost like pastoral to the whole group. They would call me, they would talk to me and they figured out over time they may not even known I was a pastor for a long time, but they figured out somewhere along the way that I was a Christian and that I was, had a distinct spirit about me. And so they would, they would look for input. They would look for advice. And I, I found that so even in your job or school or classroom or whatever, all these things are an opportunity. How does this individual, this romantic interest, see their life? Um, number so their life purpose number seven are they a provider do they have financial freedom are they responsible with their money do they have a plan is it realistic do they have savings do they have income well they may be just a poor college student still dependent on their parents but nonetheless even then what's the plan I, I've asked this question in many I over the years, I have a young man say, well, I'm really interested in her and I've got a plan and I want to, you know, the only plan is, you know, I want to propose and do all that stuff. I say, but what's your plan? In other words, how are you going to support a family one day? How are you going to get income that is actually enough? You may not have it today, but in five years, how are you going to work to a point where you could actually support a family? And I've had people get really offended with that. Just the question, just probing. Well, I don't have a plan. Well, I said, it seems to me that you should have a plan. 
you should have, you know, step A, B, C, D, and you should have a trajectory here of how you're going to provide. So, I think this is the last clip. We're going to show this. And then we'll wrap up. So that's it, eh? No more working for the old... your father. <laughs> Never thought I'd be sorry about that. But I am. Why are you sorry? I'll miss seeing you. You won't miss seeing me, because I'm not going back. Come on, Jess, now, listen. You when I was trapped on that cliff, I was terrified. That passed, and I started to see things very clearly. All I wanted was to see you again, to be with you. Nothing else. And so I hung on until you came. Jess. I have to take you back. But I'm not going back. They'll be worried sick about you. I don't care. There'll be men out looking for you, risking their lives. Anyhow, I've got to get the cattle down. Haven't you been listening to me? Yeah, it's just that... I have to finish this job. I'll take you to Spurs Place and come back for the cattle. I'm sorry. It's just that everything seems so clear to me. And he's got to go get the cattle down. Oh, what, you haven't been, haven't you been listening to me? So he's being responsible. He's, he's got a job to do. He's trying to finish that job. He has an assignment. And, but it's, it's kind of like she's a romantic and there's no bearing on reality here, right? So, so these are the character tests. Number eight, does the individual have self-acceptance? Do they have inner confidence? Could you see this person as the father or mother of your children? Uh, number nine, do they have a track record? Are they proven in character? Uh, do they have endurance in their Christian walk? So they came to the Lord last year. Have they truly left behind a promiscuous lifestyle? Is that the past? Are they hooked on porn? Are they free of all chemical dependencies? Do they show motivation to serve and be active in ministry apart from pleasing you? Um, when, when was the last time they had a lapse? You know, this kind of thing. Number 10, are they a new believer or in process? So sometimes if somebody is interested in faith and interested in the Lord, it can create a conflict of interest. So that it's because they're interested romantically, it's hard for them to separate their romantic interest from the interest in faith. And so all these things are areas that need to be looked at and weighed. Motives can become very conflicted. Coming to faith... Um, while in a new relationship at the same time can be complicated.